Good morning, good afternoon, good evening all over the world. Here's the stock market and sector performance today. Stock market was up uh, basically 1%. Uh, Eurozone was up 1%. France, 1%. United Kingdom was basically e even. Germany, Italy, Australia was up slightly. China was down slightly, about a half. Japan was up nearly 2%. New Zealand, 0.49. Let's look at the... Uh, it almost looks like today was like a risk off type day. Healthcare was up 1.76, communication was 1.62. Staples was down, that's why I'm saying it looks like this was risk off. Real estate was still positive, utilities were down and that's another, another indication it was risk off. I forgot to start with the gold and silver price, but uh, this is a six month view and you can see that we're still trading in this tight range here. In fact, we've tried multiple times here recently to try to get above 1500 and we haven't made it. Um, so we're back to basically August 6th for the uh, gold price. And then for silver, we're at uh, August 23rd. So we'll just have to see what, uh, what happens here. Now, when we look at our uh, portfolios, so ETF gold was down 0.7. Uh, silver was down 1.33 and platinum was down 0.9 so overall 0.96 the uh, ETF portfolio for miners got hit pretty good today it was down minus 3.35 it's still up 26 percent since May 30th so it's holding holding in there the improved portfolio was down 3.5 and it's up nearly 32 percent since May 30th the duty portfolio, now I'm getting into having a little trouble with this one because duty has now changed another position and so that was sold today and so I'm probably going to have to move this over to a spreadsheet to try to keep track of what's going on. Uh, the same with my uh, positions here. Mine actually shows a sale that I, I had sold the one position that he had. It's going to get all screwed up so unfortunately I don't know how to manage that with this uh, approach that they have on Fidelity. So I'm, I'll probably have to call them and see if there's a way to do that. The thing that really got destroyed today was JNUG and Nugget. JNUG was down 10%, 10.16, and Nugget was down 9.65, so overall 9.9%. All right, we're going to look at these statistics one more time. I just want to bring out the fact that, you know, when you put in a, a trend line, um, and when you're trying to analyze data, you can't come up here and pick off the top and try to compare to something else. A normal uh, trend, you're going to kind of ignore these kind of peaks because they don't fit. This is a uh, mania phase that is not uh, part of the normal trend. Uh, we're actually trying to pick off the, like the all-in sustaining cost, which is what that bottom trend is basically going to be telling us. And so right now, you know, based on the analysis of at least the uh, more mature companies, the higher tier type companies, all in sustaining cost for gold is about 895. So that becomes a floor for gold at this point. And that has to do with labor costs are going up, equipment costs, fuel costs, you know, borrowing costs, all these kind of things factor in, which uh, raise the the uh, cost of uh, mining, but it also is the difficulty of readily available ore. You know, maybe it's not as uh, uh, plentiful as it was, and so we're into lower grade ores, and that raises the cost. So all these factors come into the all its sustaining costs. Uh, you know, I saw somebody had put something out about you know just fuel costs. It's like no, there's a lot more involved in trying to find gold. So all in sustaining cost is the way you look at this, not just one metric or another. Now for silver, the silver line is right here on this scale. And so you can see that, uh, you know, say 12 or $13 is the all in sustaining cost again for the, the, you know, the, the more mature companies or the top tier companies, most profitable companies, we should say. And so this again becomes a floor. So the question is, you know, as we continue to see other pressures like inflation or other things, this is going to naturally rise. And then, you know, we're potentially, if we have some monetary problems with our currency or, or war or something else, we'll see these mania phases. But those mania phases, you can see 
they only happen like once every 30 years so you can't count on that as being you know something that's going to happen again so if the last time it was in uh, 20, 2012 I think that's what it was it could be quite some time so that's another reason why I like to spread it around mature investors do not put all their eggs in one basket mature investors will put their money and the majority of their money and get it working so let's talk about that so people have been telling me that they think uh, real estate is overvalued and uh, part of it is let me skip down here this is one of the charts that you see occasionally it's the case shiller uh, u.s national home price index and you know it's it's set up as around 1988 to be a certain like zero value and if it increases that's indicating that the home prices are increasing and but what happens is they're trying to measure the same homes not new build homes and so therefore it's not necessarily larger homes but it ignores the facts that uh, even homes that people live in they will expand and and make significant improvements which could in significantly increase the value of the home. I mean think about you know if you go all the way back to 1960 there wasn't the majority of the homes didn't have air conditioning they didn't have you know breakers in their home they didn't have double pane windows marble countertops I mean all these things think of all the appliances we have now the microwaves the you know refrigeration all this stuff uh, is significantly more expensive but uh, anyways um, this chart you can see that we ended up again with a manic phase here I don't know maybe we'll call this like a uh, uh, you know a bubble but then it came down and so then you say well is this another bubble there you to answer this question you have to say well how many homes are they building versus how many people were born and that kind of stuff so let's we're gonna get into that so here's another chart that I I liked because it put several things in one in one so the top Two, and I, I put some trend lines here starting at the same time of where the case shiller this blue line here is the case shiller and then this is gold for once somebody used gold for gold and then this is um, the Wilshire 500 or 5000 total market index and then there's a, a reddish color um, reddish brown color that's a real estate investment trust now this is uh, basically rental property but it's not necessarily just single-family homes there's big uh, buildings and such that are rented as well there's a couple of things that are interesting about this when I put my trend line on here you can see that this this kind of blew up in this range and then came down and then it fell down below the line and then it's coming back up again but if I draw the line through here you can see I don't see this as a bubble now this is for uh, you know a large part of the stock market and it's also for the um, uh, we'll call it the leased properties they follow directly with uh, the Wilshire 500 in fact it's it's more predictable line here is what it's showing now the funny thing is the case Schiller and this is what I was trying to tell you before when you have income generating property you get tremendously higher returns your property becomes even more valuable because of that and we're going to show that a little bit but you can see uh, gold is showing uh, for at least from this point if I drew this line now before I would argue this is probably more of an actual curve and there's reasons for this because the cost of mining gold in general because it we don't have a lot of plentiful gold just like oil for instance we don't have plentiful oil like we've had before so we end up with a a curve instead of a straight line so you have to have a different fit for this but I would argue that uh, you know this doesn't appear to be a bubble here and uh, at least currently we did have one passed at this point so we'll just have to wait and see so let's look at the next thing so REITs it's about leasing space and collecting rent the company generates income and so the reason why I'm bringing this up people say you know I can't afford to go buy a house but you could invest in REITs and there's a whole bunch of different REITs and I probably should do a video on that but REITs are like buying an ETF or a mutual fund and then somebody else does all the work for you of course they get quite a bit of the return too when when that happens but they have to pay out 90 percent of the profits uh, to individuals uh, to the individual investors I should say 
So that means they're keeping 10%. And, you know, me, I'm kind of a stingy guy. I want all, all the money myself because I'm pretty capable. So that's what I do. So anyways, uh, let's look at the historical returns on REITs because this, this is going to kind of shock you a little bit. The large cap stocks, which are more uh, stable, this is the returns over 40 years. There's an average return of 11.81%, but yet the REITs had 12.02. Uh, small cap stocks had 10.92, and then bonds had 7.32. This gives you an idea of uh, investing, of how you might want to you know, invest your money. And again, I don't recommend putting all your eggs in one basket unless you're a sophisticated investor. So we talked about this. Now here's another one. So we want to get into, again, trying to dissect whether we have a housing bubble or not. So I was looking for data because you have to have a lot of data. You have to know, again, interest rates is a factor. You have to know your population. Uh, I wish they, instead of building costs, they'd put housing starts, but I've got that on the next chart. And then this is showing how home prices. And so when you look at this, what happens is as the population is growing, if they don't build enough houses, houses are naturally going to go up. If they keep interest rates artificially low, housing prices are going to go up. And especially, uh, you know, if building costs were to go up, you would expect that the housing prices would go up. But this kind of has a couple things uh, counteracting. So the interest rates are going down, so I would expect housing prices to go up. Population's going up, so that would go up. So basically we're saying two out of three are going up. And in fact, lately, you could see the building costs are going up. Now, I don't know uh, exactly what date this was. I just found this. And then I, I went and looked at the United States America population clock. Now, I will tell you that this probably does not include the illegal aliens that we have in this country. So if that's the case, you know, we're growing at 1.96 million per year. And it's been like this for quite some time. And that's after you know, looking at, you know, how many are born versus how many die, we, we end up with a positive of, uh, you know, nearly 2 million people a year. So the question is, you have to know, well, how many housing starts have we had? Well, it turns out we only have 1.3 million. Now, obviously, this 1.9 million aren't going to be buying a house for, you know, 20 years or something. But you know, this would indicate that if this has held true for all over all those years, I'd have to go look at it, that we're probably not building enough houses. And this is where we were previously, where they were building, you know, way more houses. And then we had uh, a lot of excess housing, mostly because people got, you know, laid off as well. But there was a lot of speculation. I knew people at work, they were doing flipping and stuff, and they were a lot of people were, they were building condos and people were buying them, uh, hoping that they would be able to flip it, you know, and sell it for a profit. And everybody got stuck because of that. So that's a little bit different situation. You can see we're significantly below where we were before. In fact, we hit probably about 2.3, which was a million more houses a year back in 2006 than we are today. So this looks like it's being managed much more efficiently this time. And, you know, it took many years to burn off all of the foreclosures and short sales. And I would argue that actually kind of ended about here, but yet they were still doing housing starts during this time period. So the idea here, when I look at all of this stuff, um, even though this is starting to come above the line again, uh, I would argue that it's without having all the data, this is starting to look like maybe we don't still don't have enough housing. And I can tell you, locally here and even in san francisco which is a area where the housing prices are going up significantly you know they are not building like they should they should have tons of apartments being built right now but you know what they did the morons went and put in rent controls well what does rent control do you know why would anybody go and invest in an apartment complex if they know that they can't set the price for the market they won't it's not going to happen. Unfortunately, people think that they're good, doing a good idea, but it's, again, I told you before, unfortunately, liberals play checkers. The world is really chess, and you can't think in a, a very simplistic way. This is a very complex thing, and just simple data like this will help you 
make better decisions. And unfortunately, you know, they won't look at data. This is all emotion. That's the other problem there, emotion and driven. And that's, that's not helpful. And it, again, it's politics too. They're going to like, look, we're going to keep them from gouging you by doing this, but it doesn't really do that either. Anyways, I hope this answers your question. I, at this point, and especially in my area, I'll tell you, we got the same problem. They keep voting down where people want to build in, you know, apartments or condos and they won't let them. And so therefore, you know, housing prices keep going up because there's a huge shortage and that's why rents are through the roof. And that's another indicator that housing prices are not overvalued. There's actually a shortage. So that's what I'm thinking. And that's why uh, I'm happy that I made my decision when I did, because again, you could see, remember when this whole thing crashed back here on this right here, there were gobs of people working in this industry and they all had to leave and go get another dang job somewhere. And so it takes forever to build this back up again. And that's why we're nowhere near a mania because that whole industry got gutted, just like the financial industry got gutted. So it just takes time. I just wanted to make one last point. And that was the fact that during this uh, time period when I was buying my houses, uh, so many people had lost their homes because they lost their jobs or they were over leveraged and they, you know, could not uh, make their payment. And so, you know, after all those short sales and foreclosures, the funny thing is there's still a lot of people that decided and, and you know, I think another problem is these people bought McMansions they couldn't afford but they did not want to go back and live in an apartment. So they wanted to rent houses and I never had trouble renting my properties. And it's just because again, that uh, most people want to live in a house, especially people with families and stuff. They're not going to live in an apartment. So I never had trouble renting my property. So think about that. Now, uh, rents may have gone down some, but I would argue not significantly. Uh, we still, like I said, we had uh, really good profit margins. In fact, my margins are better than ever because, uh, you know, I've improved all my properties with new appliances, new uh, roofs, uh, all this stuff to where, you know, air conditioners, that kind of thing that, that needed it. And so I'm, I'm probably good for 20 plus years before I have any uh, significant expenses. Now it's just a matter of just slapping some paint on the walls, uh, you know, after five years when somebody moves out. So anyways, uh, just want you to think about that. Just because uh, we go through a recession, renting is still going to be strong, and it always has been. Again, since 1984, I've been doing this, so I'm just letting you know. It'll always be cheaper to go buy a house to live in it than it is renting. People are paying two times more to live in my places, just like everywhere else, and that's why it's so phenomenally lucrative. All right, so I hope that was helpful for you. I hope you're doing well. I hope everybody's treating you well. Do the best you can. God bless.